Congressman, you went up to the uh, the trial this week, the show trial, the circus in New York. Tell us about that trip, what you did and what you saw. You're a, you're a Green Beret, you're a soldier, but what did you make of this rule of law exercise? Well, you, you just mentioned uh, my service. I, I've served all over Africa, the Middle East, Afghanistan. I've served in countries where weaponizing the judicial system, highly political prosecutors and judges against your political opponents, kind of the norm. I mean, for example, every prime minister of Pakistan has gone to jail uh, after their term, sent to jail by the other side that that defeated them. So it, it is just striking to me and scary to me that we are heading down that road. Uh, and so, so that was one point. And if you if you doubt that, the other thing that really jumped out at me was sitting just feet away from Biden's number three official, a political appointee in the Department of Justice, who, for reasons that nobody is really pressing him or the White House on, resigned that prime key post to go to a New York municipal courtroom uh, and help a local DA uh, on this case. And if that isn't evidence enough of Biden's direction and interference, and, and you know, this DOJ official is sitting just feet away from President Trump, who is ahead of, of uh, Biden in five out of six swing states. So that really jumped out at me as well. Uh, and then, you know, finally, at the end of the day, I mean, what could be the uh, the outcome of this election or what could heavily influence the outcome of this election is sitting in the heads of 12 jurors uh, on a case that is not a crime, even if everything Cohen and others said was true. It's still not a crime. But the fact that you have uh, Hugh, I forgot how much and what a habitual liar Cohen has been. I forgot that he had testified to the Intel Committee, the Intelligence Committee in the House, about Russia and that hoax. Then he lied to his attorney about lying. Then he pl finally pled, got caught in it, pled guilty to the judge, and then lied to the judge about lying to both his attorney and the Intelligence Committee. And that was just one piece that uh, that Todd Blanche, Trump's defense uh, attorney, reminded reminded us, you know, informed the jury, reminded the world of what a habitual liar Cohen is, how many times he's been caught uh, on very serious matters. He testified before seven congressional committees and got caught lying in almost all of those cases. Uh, it, it was, it lived up to its uh, billing as, I mean, it, it's just a total circus up there. He, he really, Cohen melted down. The case has melted down for a long time. But it's up to 12 Manhattan residents. And so I think the former president's going to get convicted. I also don't think it's going to matter. I have a question for you. You're a Florida congressman. You know the former president very well. You know Florida very well. Two things about Trump. One, what powers TDS? Because the Never Trump bar online, losing their minds. MSNBC, losing their minds. And I try to be objective about this. What causes that, Michael Waltz? You know the president. You know the people in Florida pretty well. They love him down there. What deranges these people? Yeah, look, I mean, I've, I've, I've lost longtime friends, uh, former colleagues. I mean, they, people really do lose their, their mind over him. I'm, to this day, I'm still not sure uh, exactly what causes it, but it is, it is definitely a thing. It is definitely a syndrome, and these are – well-educated people who know me, who know um, you know why I'm serving, and we can't even get to the policies without getting past him. Uh, they they just can't get past his personality. Uh, I I don't know, and I remind them, you know, you, a lot of people say they like his policies. You don't get all of the policies that that truly were great for this country uh, without the disruptor that he is. Uh, you don't get. Apple without Steve Jobs. You don't get SpaceX without Elon. Uh, and they're not nice guys. Uh, you know, they, they've disrupted entire industries. Uh, and Donald J. Trump is disrupting the federal government in the good old boy kind of same old, same old way of doing things that is has the balance sheet of this country careening off a cliff uh, that, uh, you know, is, is trying to correct so many things that need to be fixed here. I think the difference this time, Hugh, is that before it was somewhat theoretical. 
Now it is people have lived the experience and it is crystal clear what their lives were like under President Trump, whether you liked him or not, and what their lives are now under Biden, whether you like him or not. Uh, and people are cutting through that. And I think that's why you see the polling uh, moving in Trump's in Trump's direction, because the world was better. Their wallets were fuller. Uh, their their families were safer uh, from a crime and a security standpoint. Uh, and that's just undeniable in so many places. And that's why I think it ultimately we're going to win in November. Now, Congressman Waltz, I want to turn to two political questions. The first one has to do with Hispanics voting for Trump. Uh, the New York Times Senate poll has the former president ahead of Joe Biden by 12 points in Nevada. Now, that is a primarily uh, Mexican-American, Central American-American population that is moving towards him. But you live in Florida. Florida's got everybody, everything. It's the most diverse state, I think. I think Florida may be the most diverse state in the union. What is driving the Latino vote to Donald Trump that he didn't have last time? It's a little bit different uh, than the Mexican Central American uh, vote that you tend to see out West. Uh, these are people, uh, particularly the Cuban, Venezuelan, Nicaraguan uh, populations that you find in South Florida that have lived socialism. Uh, they have seen the gradual decline uh, into uh, socialist dictatorships. Uh, and the, the kind of slow creeping takeover of your individual liberties uh, into the hands of unelected government bureaucrats. Uh, and so when you say the word socialism down there, it really means something. Not only have they lived it, they often still have family members that are suffering under it. You look at where Venezuela was in the 1980s, 1990s, uh, by far uh, the wealthiest, most prosperous, most educated uh, uh, closely aligned with the United States country in the Western Hemisphere, or at least in South America, for that matter, and then where it is today. Uh, and that happened in just two decades, in one generation. So when, when you lay out where the progressive left not only wants to take this country, but is actively trying to take it right now as we speak, uh, that truly resonates. So that is what's caused, I think, a massive shift in our direction uh, in Florida amongst the Hispanics there. And then, of course, uh, I, I think the Democrats have completely taken it for granted uh, Hispanics in the West in the sense of if they just talk a, a very liberal, open view of immigration, they've got the Hispanic vote. Wrong. Uh, they Wrong. are worried about inflation, the economy, whether their kids are being taught the correct things in school, often have a conservative approach from a religious standpoint, uh, coming from Catholic backgrounds. Uh, and I think the Democrats aren't speaking to those issues. And when they do, they're not in the same place as many Hispanic families are. And for that reason, you're again, you're seeing a, a, a huge shift in, in our direction. Let's close then by talking about Raisi. I do not, I still don't understand how the State Department could express condolences to Iran, other than Brett McGurk is over there in Oman trying to revive the JCPOA again. What did you make of Raisi, the response to Raisi's uh, death in the helicopter crash? I saw some people uh, send up thoughts and prayers for the helicopter. But what, what about the State Department saying, sorry for your loss? Yeah, it was really mind-blowing. I mean, you know, would, would they say the same for the, for the death of Castro, Saddam? And we could go down the list of, of brutal dictators. This guy, the butcher of Tehran, that's responsible for tens of thousands of deaths of political dis uh, dissidents under the Ayatollah, but then under his own reign as president, literally, literally, Hugh, hanging schoolgirls in the street uh, in response to the protest of Masa Amini, the young girl who refused to wear a hijab and was murdered by uh, Iranian police. I mean, this guy is a brutal dictator and a thug. Uh, and it just was mind blowing to me to see the State Department offer condolences. I, good riddance. Uh, I'm glad the guy is dead. So are all of his victims. But then for the U.N. to fly their flag at half mast to have a moment of silence and for the U.N. General Secretary say he was a man for social justice. I mean, it's just right there encapsulates everything that's wrong uh, with the U.N. It's 
I, I can't explain we, we, it. I can't get in the. In, I have the, time the, to the ask you about the ICC, the International Criminal Court. Uh, we don't belong to it. Israel doesn't belong to it. What are they up to? They're crazy. Should we sanction them? Oh, we should sanction them. Tom Cotton, uh, Elise Stefanik, and Chip Roy are, are leading the legislation. I'm on it. Uh, but really, I mean, President Trump had an executive order that did it. Just go back to the, the administration, you know, is going to point to Congress and say, well, we've got to wait on this legislation. No, they could do it right now by sanction, just like President Trump did. But once again, whether it's the border or the ICC, uh, when, when Biden wants to do the, uh, the right thing, he, he tends to blame Congress. He did forgive another few billion in student aid today. More of our taxpayer dollars go.